Hey guys, so today I wanted to have a conversation about your daily practice routine. Now I think a practice routine can vary depending on the things that you're working on, but there's some obvious things and some good things that you want to include in your daily practice routine. And I'll kind of talk about the practice routine I'm using right now. So you don't necessarily have to use a set routine. Sometimes I like to, just to make sure I'm covering everything I want to be covering. For example, now when I talk about a routine, I can talk more broadly about everything you play the entire day. That could be the warm-up routine, that could be exercises that you play to enhance your playing. Uh, it could include solos you're working on, etudes, audition music that you're working on, music you're working on for band. And we can talk about the entire routine. I want to talk right now a little bit about warming up your warm-up routine and some of the fundamentals that you play during the day, every day. And a little bit about what I'm doing right now. And you can find this online if you look at the, the Bill Adams Daily Routine. If you just Google Bill Adams Daily Routine PDF, you'll find this. It's really easy to find. And let me just make sure I'm, I'm up here. And I want this to be a conversation, if possible. If it's just a conversation with myself, that's fine. Sometimes I'm my favorite person to talk to. But if you want to jump in the conversation, if the bill out, oh, there it is, feel free to leave a message in the chat. There we go. Actually, I have another... No, I don't care. I'll talk about that later. So, I'm using the Bill Adams route. Oh, well, it's not like... It's not like of Bill Adams' routine. Bill Adams was a guy, I imagine. And I imagine Bill Adams had a lot of students, right? If you don't know who Bill Adams is, you can look him up. Uh, now, there are certain things I imagine Bill Adams gave most of his students, and he had sort of a certain way of doing it. The routine I'm looking at, if you look at the PDF file, the things I like about it, uh, from the very beginning, buzzing on the mouthpiece, they talk about buzzing on the mouthpiece to get the lips moving. And I just checked out another, another person who, they have sort of a, root, a daily routine for waking up the lips in the morning, right? So, especially right now, it's marching band season, there's a lot of playing going on. Some people like to, you know, to wake up the face sort of gradually. So some people will start with lip buzzing, right? <laughs> Except when you're lip buzzing, I want to... Some people start with lip buzzing, they wake up the face that way. <laughs> lip buzzing. They'll go into low tones, long tones on the trumpet, or even pedal tones. Uh, what I like... And this is sort of what I want to get to. I like to have a routine where I'm focusing specifically on playing as effortlessly as I possibly can. Okay? If I start with lip buzzing, for example, I think about the way, you know, I'm blowing air past my lips. If I'm blowing, you have your corners engaged, Everything's opened up in your chest and in your throat. Your stomach's pushing the air out and you're blowing. So I try to make any lip buzzing as close to that as possible. I don't like to start with, oh, is there a glare? Look at that. I don't like to start with wrenched lips and go, you know, I don't like to pinch the sound out before I've even started playing on the trumpet. So what I'll do, I'll start with blowing. And then I'll try to make the lips buzz with that sort of airflow. Lick my lips. I'm looking for a very gentle blowing. And I want it to match a very gentle lip buzz, I mean. And I want it to match the same way I would blow if I'm blowing out a birthday candle, right? The way you engage your corners here. The way the inside's a little bit relaxed, 
That's what I'm going for. I want to mimic that as much as I can in a couple of ways. One, I want to imitate the way the muscles are set in the corners all the way to the canine teeth and the inside, let me get to where you can see, and the inside is pretty loose. So if you're blowing, those are the muscles that I'm trying to engage. And then when I buzz, it's a very gentle buzz. It's not a pinched buzz, right? I don't want that. I don't want to overdo these center muscles. You get a thicker, nicer sound. All right, let me go back to my normal setup. The other thing I'm, I strive for when I'm blowing, especially at the very, very beginning of a routine, if you're just waking up your lips, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to imitate the way the airflow feels. So when you blow, there's not a lot of restriction. If you overdo your buzz, you notice there's a ton of restriction there and you're not able to blow as freely. So I like to visualize, I pick a spot on the wall that I'm blowing towards. I get the feeling of blowing, right? And then I try to gently buzz the center of the lips with that same feeling. See, I'm not impeding. I'm not cutting off my air supply at all. And this translates to a better sound on the trumpet. So again, it's and not I want the air to go through. That's what I want. I'll work on air efficiency later, but for right now, I want to feel very free blowing. That's the feeling I want, because that's the feeling I want when I play the trumpet. Not, not over pinching the middle. And if you want to check yourself, if you want to check your embouchure to see if you're over pinching the center, what you can do is you can try playing a low C, right? And then tighten your corners as much as you can without changing the tone or the sound. See, now my corners are tight, but the tone didn't change. A lot of people, a lot of students I teach, they'll try tightening their corners and it'll sound like this. And they'll pinch everything together. And I might have talked about this before. I talk about it with my students. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Abe. Oh, you speak Spanish. What a lot of people do is they'll tighten all this at the same time. A very simple exercise you can do is try talking normally and then tighten your stomach. So if you tighten your stomach and you're talking and your voice goes like this, that means that you've, you've, well, you've over tense, obviously, like your chest and your throat is over tense. Well, you want to get the feeling of tightening your stomach, you know, those are your pushing muscles, without tightening up anything else as you're talking normally. You know, your, your voice isn't going to change just by tightening your, your stomach. And you're teaching your, mu your muscles to work independently of each other. When you're a baby, if you've ever seen a baby, they ball up their fists real tight, right? And they just, it's their whole hand. Open, then fist, open, fist. What you learn to do as you get older is move each finger individually, right? Very sophisticated. So you want to have that same sort of fine-tuned flexibility with your, uh, with your muscles. <clears throat> you want to be able to tighten your corners without tightening everything in the middle, too. You want to be able to tighten your stomach without cutting off your throat and your chest. It's about using the right muscles and relaxing the right muscles and not overdoing, uh, not overdoing anything. So if you're just waking up the lips with some gentle lip buzzing, I'm thinking about airflow. I'm working on airflow. Because I want everything to be nice and relaxed. And I want to be able to have a, a nice open air stream. So when I get to the, the trumpet, and whatever you do, especially at the beginning, make it feel good. You know, it ought to feel good on your face and on your lips. Everything ought to feel nice when you're playing. So 
I'll start with, uh, you can go to mouthpiece buzzing if you want, but it has to have that same feeling of that airflow. You blow through your mouthpiece, all that air comes through pretty easily. Make it feel like that when you play, when you buzz a note. Right? Now almost every routine, whether it's a set routine, if it's a, a band warm-up, almost every, every trumpet player does long tones during the day. Right? Long tones. Now, if I go back to the, the Bill Adams routine I was telling you about, the one that I was doing just these last couple days, I like the way he sets up his long tones because the idea there is, and again, this is one of his students talking about the routine that he got from Bill Adams. I'm just going to call it the Bill Adams routine because that's what it says on the thing. Okay? So you're starting in the middle of your register for a lot of students, that's going to be middle G in the staff. For more advanced players, you might start a little bit higher. But I like the idea here because the idea is to start in the middle of your range. Where you're playing comfortably, right? And you hold it for you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Uh, what's written here on the page is to play it before you play, hear the sound in your mind before you play it, take a full relaxed breath and blow, accelerate the air through the horn, uh, keep your mind focused on the sound, blah, blah, blah. So I try to do this as relaxed as I possibly can. For me, what I like to do so I like to start with the blow. And sometimes I'll even blow and then put the mouthpiece up to my lips. Because I want it to feel like that when I'm blowing through the trumpet. I want it to be that relaxed and that open. I don't want to be pushing really hard against uh, tension in my throat or tension in the lips or you know anything I might be cutting off in the airflow. I want it to be nice and open. So again the cool thing about the way these long tones are set up, you start in the middle of your register and then you go down a half step. So G down to F sharp. And you hold it out for a while and then you go up to A flat. So the whole pattern, and you can look online, like I said, if you look at Bill Adams' routine PDF, you'll find what I'm looking at. And in the long tone section, so the first long tone starts in the middle of your register on a G, if you're using the regular long tone. Obviously you can start, you can do the more advanced one if you're looking at it. But it starts in the middle of your register, it goes a little bit, goes a half step down, and it goes a half step up from your middle register. And it goes a whole step down whole step up and you're gradually increasing your range up and down until you're playing your higher note and you're playing your lowest note okay and so you're you're slowly stretching your range in both directions high and low and I love that concept and I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of routines that use that concept you're pulling you're stretching from the middle right it's a very natural way to approach the trumpet. And again, trying to do everything, even as I'm going, as I'm going higher, where usually it's more difficult, I try to keep that, the airflow going. I try to use the corners, I try to relax the middle. I try to play it as effortless as I can as I'm going up. And just make sure I'm doing it fairly effortlessly I'll start with the, the airstream that I know I need to play the note. Let me move this over here. So if I know it takes 
that kind of air, and that's the kind of air I wanted. I want to go right through the horn. I'm going to start with that air and keep blowing until the sound happens. if you're patient with it you know when you when you blow that first note you blow the air for it if it doesn't come out you have two choices one you can crimp your lips together and uh, maybe blow extra air and try to force the note out or you can just be patient and relax into the note And I've never, I mean, the longest I ever did it was probably four minutes, where I literally just blew for four minutes until the note came out. But it always comes out eventually. Like, you can play all of these pitches relaxed. You know, it's, it's just having the patience to do it. So, long tones might seem boring. Long tones are, they can be boring. But the way that you approach long tones can make a huge difference in your in your overall playing if you if your daily routine focuses on playing long tones in a more effortless way okay so long tones that's a big part of your daily routine almost everybody does long tones um, the Claude Gordon routine does the same thing starts in the middle of the range and goes all the way up and down as far as he can in his routine and I don't know if I've had the book with me I think I put it away his routine, he'll go down to the pedal tone range and just as high as you can go and as low as you can go. Just every other one. Uh, from G, just working your way down a half step, up a half step, down a half step, up a half step, spreading it out as far as it can possibly go. And I've done that one, I've done that one before. It's a very common approach. I like the way these, after that, uh, the long tone warm up. That was a warm up. Long tone exercise, I'll call it. Next is the Clark study, number one exercise. So this pulls from a lot of different places. Long tones, you know, that's pretty obvious. Clark studies, if you're not familiar with the Herbert L. Clark studies, it's a kind of a, an important book to probably get and know. Um, I went through the Clark studies seriously uh, five or six years ago. And I mean like seriously, where you know, if you ever read the instructions in the Clark book, it's something like play through it slurred and then go back and single tongue it and then go back and double tongue it. Uh, and so I took that, especially with the Claude Gordon routine when I was using it, I would go through it the way he had it set up was something like do Clark number one and do it slurred. And that's part of your week long routine. And then the second week, you add Clark 2, but you go back and when you do Clark 1, the first Clark study, you single tongue the whole thing. And then, what was after that? I can't remember if you had a week where you just K articulate everything, but you know, it was a very thorough technique and I really enjoyed it. Going through the Clark studies, slurred, single tonguing, uh, K articulating. And if you're not comfortable with double tonguing or K articulating, I highly recommend you practice K articulating your Clark studies. Maybe not necessarily for this routine, but you ought to have a, in your daily routine, you ought to be working on some sort of scalar study. And to work on that scalar study with, uh, with the different articulations that are required is extremely important. But we'll get to articulation in a little bit. Again, the way these are set up with these Clark studies, he's starting in the middle of the register. When you're playing a Clark study, when you're playing these Clark studies, uh, I would treat them a lot like the long tones you just played. You want your air doing the same thing. 
and you're blowing through the exercise. The only air manipulating I'm doing is I might crescendo a little bit as I'm going up the Clark study. I think that just helps kind of center each of your notes. But, so that's the first one. Then he takes it down a half step. So the first one started on F sharp, and the next one's down a half step on F. Again, like a nice, relaxed, long tone. A lot of people, when you start doing something complicated or difficult, it starts tensing up in places. Try to have that same relaxed feeling throughout. And then, of course, after F, it goes up to G. That one wasn't quite as clean. And the way I... Oh, no, that's alright. I've talked before about playing fast. You don't have to play these at a fast tempo. I'm doing it at a at a reasonably comfortable tempo. You know, I like playing something as fast as I can without making mistakes. If I make mistakes, I slow it down a little bit. But I think with speed, punching the vowels down is really important. I think that's more important than playing fast because practicing perfectly is going to bring speed in the long run, which is what you want. It doesn't give you any immediate results necessarily, but they're pretty quick. Um, the fastest I ever played is when I took the Clark study slow and just banged the valves down very firmly. Because if you practice with no mistakes, your, your speed's going to go up just because you don't know how to play it the wrong way. And then when you try to play it fast, it just works. So that works your fingers, it works on relaxation, it goes through and does two octave chromatics, and a thing, about, a thing about just warming up on the trumpet is to be practical, you want to be able to get through the entire range of your trumpet in about 10 minutes, if you can. For me, if I have a good daily routine and I'm not wearing out my face with uh, a bunch of dumb, loud, high notes for no good reason. Ten minutes, yeah, I can get through my entire range and feel pretty good and be able to play just about anything. If it takes you longer than that to be at your best, then one, you're probably not sticking to a good daily routine. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Two, you're probably abusing your lips in some way. You're probably... I'll talk about that in a little bit too. But one, if you have a good daily routine where you're hitting all your fundamentals and you're setting yourself up for success every single day with a good routine, uh, teaching yourself to play more relaxed, to play with a better sound, to play more resonantly, uh, going through all of your dynamics soft and loud, your entire range, high and low, um, and you're taking care of your chops, you know, basically teaching them how to play well every single day and play efficiently and play, uh, teach your lips to be responsive, you're not going to, you're not going to have good days and bad days so often. Everything's just going to feel good if you take care of your lips. Now, where you can go wrong, let's say you have a daily routine, where you could still go wrong is, again, I know marching band season's here and everybody's playing them loud and high all the time. Uh, where you can go wrong is you start playing high and loud and you're pushing hard in your face and you're, you're overdoing the pressure and you're, you're, uh, you're just messing up your lips. I, I use this metaphor, uh, you know, first I ask people, you know, when you're getting tired from playing, where does it hurt? If it hurts here, like where do you wear out first when you get tired? For people who say corners, okay, I think that's 
that's fair. I think you want your corners to wear out before the middle because you're using the right muscles in the right proportion to some extent. There's not any hard fast rules about it, but I think it's better to use corner muscle and relax the middle. If you're wearing out in the middle, okay, um, you're probably pinching a lot in the center. You can still get a decent sound. Uh, you're probably not going to have as good, your range and endurance is probably going to suffer. Um, but here's the metaphor. Pretend you're, uh, pretend you go to the gym and you grab a dumbbell and you're lifting weights with your arm up and down, right? And you're, you're working out your bicep and your, your arm is getting tired and it's starting to hurt. It's starting to, you know, it's starting to get, you're starting to wear it out. Uh, you know what it feels like when you're using a muscle and you're wearing it out. Your, your muscle is getting tired. That's one kind of pain, all right? But that's, that's pain that we, we go through because there's growth involved. Our muscle gets stronger with that type of pain. Uh, although, I'll talk about, I might talk about that a little bit later. Uh, do you really need to to exercise to the point of exhaustion and pain to get growth? That's, that's debatable. Um, but you understand the feeling. The other feeling is just pretend that your friend comes up and punches you hard on the arm. So, in both scenarios, 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 your arm hurts, okay? From lifting weights, at least it's, it's like productive pain. You're going to get stronger from it. But when somebody just comes up and punches you in the arm, it's, a, it's worthless, unproductive pain. Well, it's the same way with the trumpet. If you're playing and you feel that muscle fatigue, okay, that's fine. I think, you know, muscle fatigue, to some degree, if you're using the muscle, that's great. You're, you're giving yourself a workout. I'll talk about in a second how much I think you ought to work your muscles, but let me let me save that for a second. If you're just pushing the trumpet into your face really, really hard and bruising your lips, uh, I would keep that at a minimum uh, at best. I would try to avoid that. Because again, if you're just pushing harder in your face to get the result of a higher, louder note, let's say, it's it's just not a productive way of playing. Sometimes I understand when the money's on the line, you have to make certain notes happen, and that's how you do it sometimes. If you don't have better technique than that, or if your lips are tired, or for whatever reason, to get a little bit higher than you can handle, you have to push harder. I understand those situations, but ideally, you're not putting yourself in a situation where you're beating up your lips every day. You know, do that as minimally as possible. Better to work the muscles. And to that, I would say, there's all kinds of routines that develop muscle strength. You can look at the, the Crusoe exercises. They're huge on bulking up the chops. The Crusoe, uh, I think it's called seconds. I'm trying to remember. But the, the idea there is you play by setting up your your embouchure, and you play the entire time with the goal to, it seems to me like your goal is to work the muscles. They're calisthenic exercises. Calisthenic. I think that's how you say it. And so, a sample would be, actually they breathe through the nose. as you can handle and I would say go as high as you can handle without 
adding extra pressure to your face. You know, make sure it's a muscle exercise and not a well, not an arm muscle exercise, let's say. You're not trying to beat up the muscles on your face. Or you're not trying to beat up you're not trying to beat up your face by pushing harder. You're trying to give yourself a muscle exercise, a calisthenic exercise. Is my understanding. If somebody's out there that knows better, please tell me. Um but when it comes to muscle development, there's kind of a debate on what's the best, most efficient way to stimulate muscle growth, let's say. I mean, you know, here in America, and I'll bet almost all of you guys live in America, if, if some of you guys don't live in America, well, that's fine. You don't want to live in the greatest country in the world. I'm just telling the truth. So, the American way seems to be day one, like you see this in the gym, you're working out muscle, it seems like the the uh, people who are very results driven think about think about the intensity level of a workout one to ten ten is so hard uh, you're just you're all out 100% heavy as you can as many reps as you can you went a ten and one is you walked in there and you ran up to the treadmill and that was it so when you're playing, when you're going to the gym, the American way is to go as hard as you possibly can on Monday, and then Tuesday you exhaust that muscle so much you have to pick a different muscle group. Tuesday you do a different muscle group. Uh, Wednesday those two muscles are so exhausted you have to pick a third muscle group. And then you do that third muscle group. Thursday, you're so exhausted from doing those other exercises because you work so hard, uh, you probably took Thursday off. But there's this idea that you go 100% and then you rest. And then you go 100% and then you rest for a day or two. Uh, the other way of exercising is to go at like a 6 or a 7. Level 6 or level 7 intensity. So if, you're, if your heaviest weight's 100, you lift 60. If you, can, if you can lift 100 pounds 10 times, maybe you only do it six times. You know, you don't push yourself to the max, but if you're, if you're giving yourself a lighter routine, you can do it more frequently. And you think about this with, with push-ups. Let's say there's a guy, and the most push-ups he can do is 100 push-ups, but he's worn out the next two days. So Monday he does 100 push-ups. Tuesday, Wednesday he's sore and tired and doesn't do any more. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday he does 100 more push-ups, but he takes the rest of the weekend off because he's too tired. So he does 200 push-ups. Imagine somebody else going, uh, doing less, doing 70 push-ups. I wonder if it would work with 60. So let's say you did 60 push-ups and you're able to do it, you know, six days out of the week, let's say, because you just weren't wearing yourself out. 60 push-ups a day, six days a week. I mean, it could be five days a week, and you'd still get 300 to 360 push-ups in, versus the other, versus doing it all out and just beating yourself up. So muscle-wise, it seems like trumpet works best when you're doing. Uh, when you're doing a good solid daily routine that covers all your fundamentals, all your basics, covers your songs and your etudes, uh, but a routine that gives you a lot of rest in the middle of it. And you're never going, you know, level 10, all out, bruising your face hard as you can because we all know what happens after you, after you do that, on, whether it's a practice routine or whether it's a performance, whether you're playing lead in jazz band or you're playing high notes in marching band, the next day, your lips are just trashed. Your response is terrible. Uh, your lips don't feel good. It doesn't feel fun to play. I would, I would keep that type of practicing to a minimum. You know, try playing. Uh, if you have to play, I, you know, play the entire range of your instrument, but don't try to push your highest note out uh, over and over and over and over again. 
be intelligent with your practice routine. Um, give yourself a routine where you you can you can play and sound your best every single day without busting your chops and having a good day and then a bad day and a good day and a bad day and a good day and a bad day. Oftentimes we have a good day and we're so excited about a good day, our chops feel good, that we want to see, well, let's see how high we can play uh, and how long we can play it and how loud we can play and we just, we beat our lips up. And I mean, this is a temptation for all of us because you get excited when things feel good. But you can have a way better routine, a more consistent routine, and you can build a better foundation by doing, believe it or not, less... Well, I'll take it back. You're not going to be practicing less, and I don't practice less. I do more in my mid-range. I do more in my mid to high range and I play the upper register more sparingly unless I have to. If I get stuck on lead trumpet for the jazz band I play with, I'll do the best I can and uh, I'm going to feel it. I think it's good to know what it feels like to go up, you know, 100%, uh, but I would do that sparingly. You know, I do it maybe once a week. Uh, if I push my upper register, for a, for instance, I'll do that a couple times a day. But I'm not doing it all day long. And if I'm doing a two-hour jazz band gig or something like that, again, that's, I'll probably, if it's a weekly rehearsal, I'll do it once a week. Um, and even then, I'm not, I, I'm careful not to abuse the lips too much. So anyway, I wanted to cover that. Might be a slight tangent. Might not be. Uh, but this next exercise in the in the routine we're talking about here, and again, you can find the Bill Adams routine. I'm not saying it's the Bill Adams daily routine. It's just uh, one of his students posted what he did based on his lessons with Bill Adams. And this is, you can look up Adams daily routine PDF. You can Google search it and you'll find a document. We just talked about going through the Clark studies, Clark number one. And these are the these are the chromatic studies. And again, the thing I like about the way that these are approached is it starts in the middle of your register and it goes down and it goes up, goes down a little farther, goes up a little further, and it expands your range from the uh, from your comfortable range. It expands upward. And I like practicing this way because as it incrementally gets higher, you can teach yourself to play those notes. Uh, it's an opportunity to practice those notes as you get higher uh, in a more relaxed fashion. Okay? And that's how I like to practice it. After that, it goes through, if you've never heard of the Schlossberg, Schlossberg, it's S C H L O S S B E R G. Schlossberg. Schlossberg. And I have that book. Uh, I'll bet it's in the other room. Great book. I like using it for warm ups, for slurs, flexibility exercises, scale exercises. It's a great routine book. But this goes through Schlossberg, where you're working on uh, dynamic changes, articulation. And again, starts kind of middle register, goes all the way down. I kind of like using it as sort of a warm-up after the octave chromatic scales right before that. After that, we have expanding scales. And this is one of the exercises that I'll do that expands the range a little bit more. Again, I like the way he does this. He's covering all the different scales. 
So the first scale is your concert F, your G scale, but it only goes up to an E. So we're on G, we go up to E. The next one goes down to an F sharp. So now you're playing your F sharp major scale, but we're only going up to an F sharp. So we were on an E, like as the high part of the range, now we're going up a little bit to an F sharp. The next one goes down a half step to F, your F scale. It goes up to a G. <clears throat> so again, this idea of starting in the middle and gradually expanding. It's, it's a great way to get around the horn. as relaxed as possible. As I'm going up, I'm going to probably hit some notes that don't just naturally pop out. And so to, manip to get used to doing what I have to do to play the note as relaxed as possible, I'm willing to risk missing the note sometimes. If I'm doing it, if I'm erring on the side of relaxation, I'll show you what I mean. it didn't work. I thought I was going to screw up and I didn't. Maybe I'll do it here. Again, the idea, I'm trying to play, and sometimes you surprise yourself how relaxed you can actually be when you're playing up and down this horn. changing the face a little bit, I try to remind myself that I'm going for this blow feeling. They talk about the feeling of riding on your airstream and using your airstream to make those notes come out. the middle a little bit more and it just came out a little bit fuller. It can be a scary feeling sometimes because uh, it feels like you might miss the note because you're so relaxed. But if you trust your airstream and your, if your corners are in place, you don't need a lot of that middle muscle as you're going up in the upper register. Again, this is the thing you can surprise yourself how easy it is to play this horn. All right, sir. <laughs>
question I'd say that I wanted. It still came out, but it wasn't quite as resonant and open as I wanted. I could feel that little bit of tension creeping in. <laughs> difficult as if because I mean I when I was younger I felt like the harder I tried on the trumpet the more difficult it was which can be a really frustrating feeling you know you keep trying you keep trying keep trying and you're getting worse and worse but it's just it's if you're trying really hard it's often you're just tensing up more and you end up fighting yourself you know you tense up the inside you have to blow harder to blow the lips open enough to make the note come out and that's just it's really bad for lip resonance about where my range like I keep I have so much tension in the middle by the time I get to that one note like I can hold off for quite a ways but in the end right around there <laughs> positions because since I have an older bite with my teeth I tend to play down because my top teeth come over my bottom teeth and so my angle changes sometimes I it creeps up and that adds up extra pressure to the top and the notes don't want to come out but anyway <laughs> about all the farther I'm going to go. And again, the... I don't want to say the payoff. If I try to force those notes out, it's just going to take away from my practice time. You know, to chase after a couple of notes that really aren't that important, you know, it's just a couple of notes higher. To me, it's not worth it because, you know, I have a whole practice routine I'm going to try, I'm trying to get through. I'm trying to work on articulation, scale patterns, fingers improv, different etudes I'm trying to play. It's not worth tearing up my chops to hit a couple of extra notes just for the heck of it. It's just not that important. Especially if it's just going to mess with tomorrow's routine and make it harder to play. So for exercises like this I try to go as high as I can with reasonable relaxation but I'll push it just a little bit too. But I'm never going to overdo it. Sounds like somebody's ready for bed outside. Jeepers. Do you guys have kids? And then it goes back to Slossburg. <laughs> so instantly I go back and try to focus on corners, air. <laughs> people have trouble slurring up and I've talked about this before making your lips responsive enough to 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 make the note ascend by blowing air through the horn you know if you, if you increase your airflow you want the note to pop upward you know and you, you want your lips to respond appropriately to that airstream to allow that to happen uh, but the, the Sloss, the Sloss Burger, great. Another thing that I work on 
personally, is starting on higher notes. I can, I can start on lower notes and tell myself to relax as I go higher. I have more difficulty and I practice trying to start on higher notes with more relaxation. relaxation I mean relaxing this center part as much as I can that's the real kind of relaxation that I'm dealing with because uh, with my own routine you know, the thing that I naturally return to is extra tension here in the center so after the Slossberg it goes through more Slossbergs flexibility harmonics all over the place it finally gets into articulation and I think it's uh, it's a reasonable articulation pattern to go through every day. Um, and I like using this whole thing sort of as a, as a daily warm-up routine. I know I said that a warm-up should only take about 10 minutes, so you can kind of play whatever you want to play. Because it's, it's just not practical if you have, and I've had this happen a lot, where I have to play at a 9 o'clock in the morning mass. You know, the church is at 9 o'clock and i got to play for Easter or something like that. Uh, you know, you can't, I mean, you could conceivably wake up early, and sometimes I will, uh, especially if I'm having a, a string of bad days where the lips aren't quite as responsive. I'll wake up earlier and I'll try to get the lips moving. Um, everybody's a little bit different, you know, for some people, and depends on how much you're playing every day, too. Uh, for me, I used to wake up at 5 in the morning when I was in high school, just so I could start waking up the face with a... Uh, with pedal tones and long tones. It felt good on the face. But it was because I was just doing dumb things during the day, trying to play higher than I could handle and playing longer than I probably should have. But you know, you're young and dumb and you do things like that when you're young. So I covered a lot of the things I wanted to talk about with sort of a daily, a daily, kind of a daily routine for long tones, playing more relaxed. We talked about fingers, going through fingers a little bit. Um, I, I didn't talk about your day's entire routine. This was more about sort of how to approach the warm-up, how to approach long tones, and how to approach your playing in general when you're doing your r daily routine. I highly recommend that you find a daily routine that you like and that you can stick with for a period of time. Uh, you know, for sure, you ought to go through some routine for a week or two weeks before you change it up. It, uh, it depends on your, your playing demands, your time demands. Uh, if you're, you know, somebody working on their jazz etudes is going to have a different, different daily routine than somebody working on their classical etudes, let's say. Probably. But there's also certain fundamentals that most every trumpet player ought to go through, or probably should go through, or probably needs to go through. Like the long tones, some finger patterns, some articulation patterns, uh, some flexibility patterns, and those are the big ones. You know, playing with a good relaxed setup. Long tones. <laughs> playing through, working your fingers. Going through and practicing your articulation. And when I practice articulation, I practice single tongue. I practice my K articulation only. K articulating. I'll practice double tonguing. I gotta think, oh, I use a different finger. that up and I'll change the articulation around. Uh, so instead of t 
taka taka. I'll go kata kata. I'll work on slurring, obviously. What's another articulation I'll use? I'll do doodle tonguing sometimes. Daedle deedle diddle doodle doodle. <laughs> enough to sound good on it but I'll do it anyway um, so that's articulation you want to work on some sort of harmonic slurring every day you know fundamentals. Dynamics, you want to definitely work on dynamics. I might get into this more on another video, but dynamics are just crucial. Especially starting soft, crescendoing loud, and then decrescendo again at the end. It's super applicable with the with the uh, with the type of playing in, that you ought to be doing when you're playing classical etude, let's say. Uh, I'm gonna sneeze. <coughs> oh, I hope that got on camera. Okay. <laughs> you know, sometimes you need to end a note really, really soft. The way you build up a phrase. Soft, allowed to soft. It's very effective. And if your lips aren't used to that, if your air isn't used to working with your lips to get that effect, you're going to have a really tough time doing it. So practice your dynamics. What else is there? I talked about articulation. Rhythms. You want to practice rhythms and subdivisions. You want to be able to play. I like doing, uh, I got this from a friend of mine uh, who actually teaches here in town. He had uh, his students do it, and I like it a lot. But he would, this is a subdivision exercise. Subdividing uh, your note into one, two, three, four, five, six beats per six subdivisions per beat, I guess I, you would say. Definitely practice that with a metronome. I should have played it with a metronome, but you get the idea. Doing harmonic slurring like that is also good. trills you know there's so many there's so many things that you can work on with a trumpet I'm not going to cover everything but these are a lot of the fundamental things that you definitely should work on you should read something classical you should read something jazz you should try to improvise um, if you're just a one genre kind of trumpet player you know focus on if you're focusing on classical music you're probably going to have all state etudes to audition with you should be working on a solo you should work on maybe an orchestral excerpt. Excerpt. It's a funny word. If you're a jazz, if you're a jazz guy, you want to work on your reading. You know, some of the trouble I have is that the exercises I do are so cognizant that sometimes I'll forget, I'll forget to just practice reading music, uh, which is why I practice classical music also. 
but reading jazz music, memorizing jazz tunes, memorizing, uh, learning ideas in all 12 keys. It just depends what, uh, it depends what you're doing. You know, I'll practice songs for the band that I'm playing with. I'll practice songs for my students, ones that they're learning. You ought to practice the songs you're working on for school. So it, it takes a, it's a ginormous time investment. There's no time for, for video games. So, all right. And then uh, to have a good warm down routine. You want your face to feel good when you start playing and you want your face to feel good when you're done playing. So just like you did when you started, I remember in high school, it felt good for me to just blow a pedal tone. I just subbed from when you showed me. I just subbed from when you showed me at a school. I just subbed. What do you mean you just subbed? I just subbed from when you showed me at a school. Well, I'll say hi. No, that's not hi. You subbed for what? What did you sub for, Crashinator? You have to tell me. Hi, I just subbed from when you showed me it at school. Is that a misprint? Do I not understand? Explain yourself. But well, it's good to see you. Crashinators. You don't have to tell me who you are. I'll figure it out. I just subbed from when you showed me it at school. So with your, uh, I used to do pedal tones. And when I do this, when I did this, I, I do it still too. It, feel, it felt better with all valves down. You subscribed. Ah, that's what you mean. I just subscribed from when you showed me at school. Now I understand. I'm so glad to hear it. Thank you so much. I hope you learned something. Anyway. If you have trouble playing pedal tones, like those really low notes that I'm doing, a uh, really easy way to do it is put your trumpet up like this and put the top of your trumpet under your nose and bring your bottom lip out of the trumpet and play and then blow. That can sort of get you started. I learned that from, uh, well I mean I've, I've always done pedal tones, but her name Jan, Jan G. Poshius. I don't know how you pronounce her name. Somebody else might know. But I like the way she explains how to do pedal tones. But it just, it feels good on the face. Strong corners, the inside's very loose and relaxed. It's like massaging your lips. And so I'll start with that. When I'm warming down, I'll play. A lot of low register chromatic stuff. You know, anything that works your way down is going to be probably a good warm down. Anything that relaxes your lips. And you can tell. You can tell when your lips feel good uh, when you're warming up or when you're warming down. That's what you gravitate towards. You want your lips to feel good and you want your playing to be full and resonant. You want playing to be easy. And so these low notes, these long tones uh, are very helpful in resetting your chops for another day of playing. Low notes are great for that. And for me, I'll always end uh, with soft notes, too. It teaches me to use strong corners and a loose center to be able to play soft. 
So I talked a little bit about the warm-up. I talked about a good daily routine covering a lot of the fundamentals and you know fundamentals of that you might use in a warm-up and also the warm down. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to to ask or comment. I appreciate you guys checking in and watching. I know you guys are kind of in and out. A lot of my students were at a football game tonight, so go you guys. Uh, I'll have some more, I'll probably have some more videos up here soon. But like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to post, let me know. Thanks for checking in. And if nobody comes in and if you don't ask anything, that's fine with me because this is a good way for me to to sort of archive my practice routine and to you know to have an idea of how to articulate some of my thoughts you know a lot of you guys uh, saw me talking in class I work with a lot of you guys in lessons you know this helps me with the uh, the type of material that I want to be thinking about the type of ideas that I want to get across to you guys in lessons and in master classes and so this is helpful for me to sort of get my thoughts together too. So I appreciate you guys listening. I appreciate you guys coming in. Like I said, feel free to comment, ask any questions. Um, I think that's all I'm gonna talk about today. Yeah, so have a great night, have a good weekend. I'll probably come back on tomorrow, so yeah. See you then, talk to you guys later. Oh, come